Hello and welcome to part two of the data transfer modifier video. It's been a while, huh? Hello. Oh. You didn't see that. That didn't happen. Uh, uh, you, you know what? Let, let's just get started. It's pretty obvious at this point that none of us understand what the documentation means. And that's exactly why I'm making this video. So back in part one, I left off really only explaining half of what you can do with this thing, if not less. And you may have noticed I skipped over an option, an option under vertex data called bevel weight. Ooh. But what you might also notice is that there's an option in this list with the same name and description. At first I thought these were duplicated, but there is a very small discrepancy. This one says ver vertex and it says which vertex data layers to transfer and the other one says which edge data layers to transfer. Of course I would have to mess around for hours just to figure that out. After noticing that, it's not hard to see that this one transfers bevel weight that's been applied to a vertice, and this one transfers bevel weight that's been applied to an edge. Edges being the line in between two vertices in case you didn't know. So these are actually two separate options. They function the same, but they transfer two different types of data. And even though this one is up here right beside vertex groups, it has nothing to do with them. So don't let it fool you. The reason I'm saying that is because it fooled me. Let me explain. I found that the descriptions had a little extra detail that I could go by, unlike the documentation. But it would turn out that they're messed up just as bad, if not worse. Take another look at the description. It says which vertex data layers to transfer. Which vertex data layers. Something seems a little bit off here, right? That's because bevel weights don't have layers, but that's not all. They all say it. So that's not confusing. As you may already know, layering works by putting data on top of data, like you would in a 2D image editing program. You know, I want this one on top of this one. Pretty simple concept. But here's the problem. Of the 12 data types that you can transfer, only three of them can be layered. Vertex groups, UVs, and vertex colors. I covered vertex groups in part one. If you haven't seen it already, feel free to go check it out. Anyway, why do the descriptions say which layer to transfer? If you know, they don't have any. It appears to me that they're using the word layer incorrectly. If we change the word in the description to type instead of layer, look at what we get. Which vertex data type to transfer? Just by changing one word, now we can understand it. You know, if this just said type to begin with, then I would assume that I'm working with a completely different type of data. But looking at this and seeing the word layer kind of makes me think that's what it is. So this is weird and very confusing, but what's going on here is uh, they just use the wrong word and that's all there is to it. It doesn't help that there are arbitrary layering options down here either. All it did was confuse me even more. By the way, don't use this, it's, it's kind of weird. Anyway, because of these, I got something wrong in part one. You remember I said that vertex weight and vertex data are exactly the same thing. Well, I was wrong. It turns out that vertex weight is just a type of vertex data, and vertex data is any type of data that a vertice holds. When something has little to no information, the wording you choose to use in order to explain it means a lot. And the way they have it worded made me assume that I'm working with a different data layer, not a different data type. And because of that, I thought the bevel weight down here was the same as the bevel weight up there. That's why I skipped over it and assumed that vertex weight held within vertex groups was the only type of vertex data. Obviously, they didn't duplicate it, because why would you do that? I may have jinxed it. Here I had this whole thing recorded where I was going to say, hey, wait a minute. If these are all the options for transferring vertex data, then where are vertex colors? What? Uh, but Blender got an update. Okay, maybe Blender got a few updates. <clears throat> yeah. But anyway, the option to transfer vertex colors is now up here and down there. Uh, 
Okay. And instead of saying vertex colors like in the last version, they just say colors? Blender, what are you doing? Oh, that's funny. It won't let me paint vertex colors on these face corners. That's not a face corner. That's a vertice. They transfer the same type of data, 100%. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. Pause for a second. Old me, you're wrong. Okay, so at first I thought they transferred the same thing. But after a little bit of testing, clearly the data transfer modifier refuses to transfer the data based on which option you have selected here. So it would appear that the reason we have a new option here is because we have a new type of data in Blender. Or maybe it's the same type of data with a flag that says it's not. Because as far as I can tell, vertex colors are held on the face corners. That's why the option was originally under the face corner drop down menu. Of course, I didn't know this until I tried to figure out why the heck we have the option up here now, and that ended up leading me down a rabbit hole of figuring out that vertex colors don't even exist in the Blender universe anymore. Nope, apparently they're just called color attributes. Okay, so technically they are the same thing. Technically they're still vertex colors. They're just being held under a different domain, a different name, and a different use case. Which just goes to show how tricky and advanced all of the data types and the data transfer modifier really are. This is definitely not something you want to get into if you're new to Blender. It'll pick you up, throw you down, pick you up again, throw you down again, and that's what it did to me. I'm dead. I'm brain dead. But anyway, there is a difference between these two types of data, but it's not like they updated the Blender documentation to tell us that. In fact, it doesn't even go over the different types of data you can transfer. It would be nice if they could, I don't know, put a link there to the different types, but I, I mean, I, I guess whatever. Anyway, the difference is actually really simple. If you can figure out that, the difference I mean. So since I already did, what is the difference? Well, the difference between the one under the vertex data and the one under the face corner drop down menu are where you're going to be using those different types of vertex colors. The ones that you can transfer under the face corner options, the original ones, are the ones that you create whenever you go into vertex paint mode and then paint on your mesh. These fall under the face corner category, because like I said, vertex colors are actually stored on the face corners. As for the other ones, the new ones under vertex data I mean, they're not even created in the vertex paint mode, instead they're created in sculpting mode. They actually have a better uh, set of brush options too. So anyway, they're not duplicated. The me from a few seconds ago that said they were duplicated was actually me from a year ago. So yay, I guess. I'd love to go over these, but I'm not really here for that. I'm here to talk about the data transfer modifier, remember? Ugh, it's just so confusing. Eh, let's go back to me from a year ago. Anyway, now that I got that out of the way, let's go ahead and move on to edge data. First, there's sharp. Sharp can be used in a few ways. Under the object data properties and under normals, there's a setting that tells the rendering engine not to shade smooth wherever it's marked. Kind of like having two separate pieces of geometry that aren't even connected. This can be used to simulate the shading of split edges. Except of course it's not actually split, which is kind of nice. You can use auto smooth or you could set it up all the way and specify where you don't want it smoothed. It can also be used by the edge split modifier, which will actually split the edges. Next up is UV seams. UV seams are a type of marker placed on edges that tells it where to split the UVs whenever you unwrap a model. If you put them in the right place, it pretty much does all the work for you. Then comes the part when you have to try to fit everything into a square image. Why? Why? Ah! That's a discussion for another time though. Next, we have crease. You have to use this one in conjunction with a subdivision surface modifier, as far as I know. It also works with a multi-res modifier, and it basically just lets you scale down the strength of the smoothing effect you get from the subdivision surface modifier. So wherever you don't want it to be smoothed, just hold shift E and pull your mouse away. You might be able to use it in other modifiers, but I couldn't find any, so I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to bevel weight. Bevel weight is a value that I'm pretty sure is only used by the bevel modifier. It lets you specify the size of a bevel on edges or vertices. And just like sharp, you can set it to only affect the edges you mark. But unlike sharp, bevel weight also works on single vertices and not just edges. I'll get to it someday. Last in this list is freestyle. Marking an edge as freestyle will tell Blender where to draw freestyle lines when you render an image. Of course, the best part is that with this, you can specify where those lines are drawn. 
and I don't really know that much about it, so sorry I'm too lazy to give a better explanation. Next we have face corner data. Actually, I'm skipping over this one, just for now though. I want to save the best for last. Oh, and I'll get into the mapping options later too. And so here we have face data. And to this face data, I give a face palm. First in this list, we have an option that's called smooth. You know how you can right click a model and select shade smooth? This is essentially the same thing, except it lets you individually choose what faces you want to be affected. There's almost no reason to have to use this though, and the need to transfer it would be one in probably more than a million. In fact, I've never even used it, and I've never seen anybody use it. I would honestly just use Mark Sharp. So I'm gonna go ahead and just go to the next thing. So next up is an option called Freestyle Mark. We have a very similar option up here. As I said just a minute ago, this one marks edges as freestyle, which allows you to render lines on top of geometry. Just like with bevel weight, the only difference is uh, in the description. And when this one says which poly data layers to transfer, it's talking about the faces. I didn't even know you could mark faces as freestyle. I mean, not until I saw this. But yeah, there's an option in edit mode under the face menu. Oh yeah, also there's a couple of menus where you can find the vertex data and edge data options we went over a minute ago. And they also show the shortcuts right beside them. So if you were wondering how to apply the data before you transfer it, there you go. We're finally here, face corner data. I'm going to jump ahead and explain vertex colors and UVs first. So that means next up is vertex colors. The colors option can be used to transfer vertex colors. And though I'm not that educated on them, they can be used for a lot of things. Cheap ambient occlusion, emission effects, foliage animation, and much more. I'll have to do a deep dive into all the things you can use them for sometime. And the ability to use them as a mixing factor just makes it all that much better. Whee! Yay. Now let's talk about transferring UVs. Most of you probably already know that it's called UV unwrapping because you literally unwrap your model. It then gets put into a 2D image thingy where you can move all the points around like it's a mesh. But it's not a mesh. On what exactly resembles your mesh are a bunch of little points that hold coordinates. And depending on where these points are, it'll shrink or stretch the image behind. As for transferring UVs with the data transfer modifier, you might be a little bit disappointed. Or a lot disappointed. You would think that the data transfer modifier would be the perfect way to transfer UVs, but it would seem that's not the case at all. After everything I did and all the time I took to figure things out, it seems like you can only transfer UVs from a high poly model to a low poly model. Transferring the other way around messes things up pretty badly. At least every time I've tried to transfer that way, it's just produced a really glitchy mapping. Even on something as simple as the default cube. But what I find odd about that is the fact that I can manually set up the UVs to look exactly the way I want, while the data transfer modifier apparently just can't. But hey, uh, who knows, maybe you'll have better luck with it than I did. This could be a really fast and easy way to make lower poly models for use as various LODs in a video game. If you could get it to work. Or you could just do it manually. It's not really that hard to decimate geometry while leaving UVs alone. You wouldn't ever actually need to use this modifier for that, you could just use Control X. I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, move to the next thing. So let's go ahead and talk about the final few things in this modifier, and probably the biggest thing, normals. First I need to explain what normals even are, and to do that I'm gonna go ahead and explain what normal maps are too. So let's go ahead and talk about normals, and normal maps. Yeah, you didn't see anything. I'm very professional. Most of you probably already know this, but normal maps can change the way that a model looks without actually changing the way that it looks. By that I mean without actually changing the geometry, you can make a model look like it has more geometry where there really isn't anything, except for some purple colored image. Anyway, while normal maps can add detail where there isn't any detail, normal normals work a little bit differently. You might remember in part one I said something about normals. As you may already know, you can transfer normals. Not to be confused with normal maps, yeah that. I said this knowing that I would want to elaborate later on here in part two, and that's because while there is a big difference between normal maps and normals, they're actually really similar, almost even the same thing. So what are normals? Well, when you create a mesh, 
your mesh normally has faces, and every face is always facing a direction. Now imagine you can use a little bit of magic and make this face appear that it's rotated at a different angle, even if it's not. Sounds kind of weird, right? Actually, that's just what normals are. Normals are essentially the angle that a face holds. At least that's what everybody would tell you, but in reality, there's a lot more to it than that. Like the fact that there are three different types of normals. Face normals, face corner normals, also known as split normals, and vertex normals. Normals on your vertices, for those of you who don't know what vertex means. It's just a single vertice. Anyway, these normals are used for different things. Take face normals, for instance. They're used for, well, people say they're used for smooth shading, but that's not true. Face normals are just the angle at which a face is actually facing. This is needed for certain calculations in the background, like for back face culling, or if the rendering engine wants to know if this is actually the inside or the outside of the mesh, which way it's really pointing. These are the kind of normals that are responsible for your inverted normals, or as a lot of people like to call them, flipped normals. Face corner normals, on the other hand, are used to shade a model as smooth. You know, whenever you right click and hit shade smooth, they're also used for surface reflection and or fake surface angles. And on top of that, they're also the only type of normal you can manually edit. While these are the ones you would be changing in order to change the way your surface is shaded, the face normals still have a little bit of influence on them. And what I mean by that is if you take your face normal and you invert it, these are gonna become inverted too. That's why the reflections will be different if your face normals are inverted. Even though face normals don't control the shading, they do have some influence in that they do control the initial direction direction the others are facing, but they're not really in control. It's the face corner normals that are. The only thing face normals have to do is face in the right direction, preferably on the outside of the mesh. While the face corner normals or split normals are responsible for the way that a surface is shaded, the third type of normal, vertex normals, are here to average out the values of the face corner normals in order to make the surface as smooth as possible. Or at least it appears that way. I couldn't find very much information on it, but according to Wikipedia, it's intended as a replacement to the true geometric normal of a surface. The true geometric normal, as you might have guessed, is the face normal. Wikipedia goes on to say that using vertex normals, much smoother shading than flat shading can be achieved. So these are intended to make your model as smooth as possible. And that makes sense because they are exactly centered between the face normals. And if you want your shading to be as smooth as possible, rotating the face corner normals to be dead center would be the way to do it. Because by doing that, you'll be using the average value between each face, splitting the normal weight perfectly between each face normal. And so each face corner would be smoothed perfectly. But sometimes this is not the intended result. Sometimes you're going to want your normals to have more weight over others. Speaking of normal weight, I need to go over those. And by those, I'm referring to weighted normals. Much like everything in this video, if you don't know what that is, you're about to learn. In Blender, when people talk about weighted normals, they're referring to changing the angle of your face corner normals. Except what you're doing is you're changing the normals in a very specific way. Typically, you can just use the default settings on the weighted normal modifier. And what that's going to do is it's going to make your face corner corner normals point in a very specific direction, perpendicular to the normal on the largest face beside them, ignoring the small faces and even rotating their normal towards the biggest face's normal, because it's using those small faces for interpolation. By interpolation, I mean the smooth kind of rounded edge look. This improves the shading and makes it look like it has a hard surface, as though you had put a subdivision surface modifier on it and added extra edge loops to make it look that way. But it's really just a trick using the normals. Also make sure you add a bevel, because if you don't, it's not really going to work right, because because those small faces won't be present for the interpolation. Also because it takes the smallest faces normal and aligns it to the biggest faces normal, which of course still applies to your mesh even if you don't have a bevel on it. Also you might have noticed that the split normals aren't split anymore, and they're not split anymore because whenever you shade smooth a model, your face corner normals actually align with the vertex normal. Because whenever you shade smooth a model, you're actually choosing to align your face corner normals to the vertex normals rather than the face normals, and that's how they get that really smooth look, which is also how how they can have that shaded smooth look while pointing in the same direction they would be if you never shaded your model as smooth, because the split normals on the smaller faces are now aligned to them. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, shade smooth does not turn on interpolation between normals. I've heard a lot of people say it does, but you want to know the truth? They're already interpolated. It's just that they don't look like they are until they're rotated. Anyway, the data transfer modifier will only transfer the values from the face corner normals. If I invert one of the face normals on our source mesh, that won't get transferred over. 
It's pretty crazy. I actually just assumed that and then I went and tested it and it turns out to be true. But then again, that's what I've been doing for the entire video. Recording audio and assuming and then testing. That's actually how I've been figuring everything out. On a side note, I've recorded over 20,000 times and only kept about 5,000. But anyway, that doesn't matter. So the data transfer modifier transfers the angle of face corner normals from one mesh to another. And all meshes have normals. So how do normal maps work? The first time you see one, you might think, uh, what the heck is even going on here? But has it ever crossed your mind to think, why are normal maps purple? Why? Taking a look at this normal map that I slapped together for the purpose of this video, you can see that we have three colors, R, G, and B. If you don't already know the reason why this is, then I'm about to knock your pants off. Because do you know what else is R, G, and B? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, oh, 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 you almost got it, oh. That's right. X, Y, and Z. Okay, but what is that? X, Y, and Z signify the location that an object is at within a 3D space. Over here, you can see the X and Y axis. Z is hidden by default, but I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about a set of values that use those, which can be revealed by hitting the N key on your keyboard. These 3D coordinates are the key to how normal maps work. X is left and right, Y is forward and backward, and Z is up and down. When you move an object, these will update, or you could change them directly in this menu, and you'll see that as you do, your mesh moves around. Okay, but what am I getting at? I'm talking about what these three values are called. When separated, they're not called this, but put together, these three values are known as a vector. A vector is basically just a container or a group that holds three values. These values correspond to X, Y, and Z. Usually vectors are used to tell where something is in world space. World space meaning how far an object is offset from the world origin. That little spot right there where the X, Y, and Z axis intersect. Okay, so vectors hold a position. But they're also used in normal maps. So the question is, how? Well, while it does sound really complicated, it's actually really easy to explain. And to do that, I'm going to use a subdivided plane. If I grab one of these faces, I can move it around by hitting G. That's the shortcut for grab. So as I move my mouse, the face that I have a hold of moves too. But there's also that same menu up there here in edit mode. And once expanded, you can see that those values are changing for the face that I have selected. So in object mode, we have a vector that tells where our object is. But also inside edit mode, you have locations for every single vertice, which are of course, all vectors. The only reason it's showing one vector when I have four vertices selected is because I'm in face selection mode. And you'll see why in a minute. I'm gonna grab this face and I'm just gonna move it up. And so just by doing that, I've done something phenomenal, at least in terms of explaining how a normal map works. So you notice how these edges are still connected? If I hit seven on my numpad and go into top view, you'll see that this looks basically the same. But because I offset one of the faces, the way the light bounces off of the surface is now different. And because these face corners are connected, it can tell what angle the face beside it is at. So again, why are normal maps purple? For those of you who didn't immediately connect the dots, let's go back and look at my normal map that I made for the video. Do you still not see it? Fair enough. <laughs> I'm just messing with you guys. Thought it'd be kind of a funny way to explain it. So a normal map is an image, and images are basically a collection of pixels. Those pixels can have a mix of R, G, and B. Each and every pixel in a normal map holds a different color. Therefore, every single pixel holds a different coordinate and a different location. Which means each and every oddly colored pixel in a normal map is a vector. But there is one more thing. Normal maps actually use fake face corner normals. And I'm talking per pixel. And they don't have to worry about face normals to know which way they're pointing because they're already setting on one. That calculation is already done by the face. Pretty cool, huh? Well, except for the fact that they're fake. And because they're fake, you can't view them like you can on a mesh in edit mode. So they might not be real, but to the rendering engine they are. And since they're all faked, they're not changing your geometry. All they're really doing is just changing the way the surface is shaded by faking having face corner normals, which also fakes having extra faces. Speaking of the fact that they're fake, there's something you need to keep in mind if you're baking normal maps. And that's that normal maps, even though I've already said it, don't change geometry. They just fake having small amounts of geometry on the surface of faces. Not using enough geometry where you need to can cause a lot of issues. You have to know exactly what you're doing, otherwise if anything's off, you're screwed. Not to mention getting the UVs to match up afterwards. That's always so fun. 
So yeah, uh, normals are pretty crazy. And I would have never known what they were if it weren't for the research I did for this video. And by research, I mean the endless messing around I did until my head fell off. You're very welcome. I think I explained that pretty well. So let's transfer some normals. Here I have a mesh that I added some detail to. And over here, I have another mesh that I just subdivided a bunch of times. I feel like these will represent what I'm doing pretty well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer the detail from this mesh over to the one that doesn't even have detail. It's flat, but I should be able to transfer the normals anyway. So just like in part one, let's add the data transfer modifier, and then we want to tell it to use local space and not global space because I moved this one over to the side. That'll tell it that even though it's been moved off over here, it should still act like it's not been moved. I did cover this in part one, but I feel like it's important that everybody knows what this does. So I'm just going to repeat myself. I'm so sorry. Yeah, not really. Anyway, let's hit this dropper and select the mesh we're transferring from. So now that the modifier knows what mesh we're trying to transfer from, let's go ahead and select the type of data we're transferring. Of course, this one's obvious because we're transferring normals. And as soon as we check that, we end up getting an error. Ooh. So what this is doing is basically just saying it doesn't have any control over the normals right now and you need to go check a box so that it can change them. That checkbox is found under this green triangle, aka the Object Data Properties tab. In this list, there's an option called Normals. Hitting the drop down button, we get another option. It's a checkbox called Auto Smooth. You remember earlier whenever I was talking about Shade Smooth and how you can set certain faces to not be smooth? This does exactly that, except it's automated based on what angle you want to set here. You can think of it as automatically marking an edge sharp based on its angle. It doesn't actually mark anything sharp, it just skips shading it as smooth. And I forgot to mention earlier that Mark Sharp actually uses this setting. You have to have it turned on before Mark Sharp will do anything. Mark Sharp is basically just a manual toggle for this. That way you can be more specific and not have to deal with this automatic stuff. Anyway, you have to have this on before you can transfer custom normals. So just hit this checkbox and set the value all the way up so it's not changing anything automatically. As you can see, we've successfully transferred the normals. But it doesn't really look right, obviously. The reason for this is because of the mapping method being used in order to transfer the detail over. Obviously, I have enough vertices here on my plane to make that detail possible, but it's not being transferred correctly. In order for it to accurately represent this, we need to change the mapping method. So back up in the modifier, you can see that we have these options. These mapping options are essentially the rules that the data transfer modifier uses to reach back and grab the data that it needs for the type of data you're transferring. And different options can be useful for different types of things. After the few things I've done to transfer the normals, I kind of got them transferred. So I could say that's all you need to know in order to transfer normals. Except that obviously, there's a lot more to it than just getting them over there. I want them to look right. So I'm going to go ahead and go over all of these mapping options as well. As you might have noticed, each category of data actually have their own specific mapping options. So the options up here, the ones under vertex data, won't work on your normals. And likewise, the ones under face corner data won't work for vertices. Anyway, let's go ahead and explain what these are. Let's start with the easiest option, topology. Luckily, the description tells us pretty much exactly what it does. It transfers data from geometry that exactly matches the geometry you're transferring to. In other words, it won't transfer correctly unless you have the exact same amount of vertices in the exact same location. Well, they don't have to be exactly matching, as far as location goes, but give one of your models one more or one less vertice, and you'll run into an error. Even so, it's not as limited as it sounds. You can actually choose which vertices to transfer and how to mix the data that's transferred over. If you know anything about mixing modes or blending modes as they're called in most programs, then you should immediately know all the possibilities you can use this for. But there's another option that's basically a mixing factor of vertex weights. No, I'm serious, you use vertex weights as a mixing factor. The option is right there, with a description that doesn't actually tell you that's what it does. Cool. Vertex weights make a really, really good mixing factor. And that's because they're linearly interpolated between two points. Don't worry, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But the important thing right now is that you know exactly how you're transferring your data. 
The next one is Nearest Vertex. This one works by taking the location of all the vertices and individually comparing them to the vertices on the mesh you're transferring from. Once it's found the nearest vertice, it copies the data over. And no, I didn't say that wrong. See, the thing is, we're not transferring data. Notice in the description that it specifically says copy from closest vertex. The key word here is copy. The data transfer modifier doesn't actually transfer data. The fact that it leaves the data alone on the first mesh means it's just copying. But calling it the data copy modifier doesn't really have that ring to it. So I'll go ahead and leave it alone because I've done enough damage as it is. So basically for each vertice it reaches back, finds a target, takes that data, and applies it. In the exact order my arrow just showed you. So this option is really basic. Let's move on. The next one is Nearest Edge Vertex. This one is really similar. Instead of finding the nearest vertice, it finds the nearest edge. And then it traces that edge to find the nearest vertice along that edge. So just like the description says, it copies from the closest vertex of the closest edge. Might sound a little bit stupid, but that's really how it works. You would not believe how many versions of this video I threw away. They were so wrong. Anyway, let's move on to the next option. But before we do that, I want to point out one more thing. If you're transferring to a mesh that has a vertice right in the middle of one of these edges, then it'll be forced to make a choice. That's why sometimes you see glitchy little things like this. This is because it has to make a choice between these two vertices, and that's not easy when the distance is exactly the same, especially since that's the algorithm it's using to grab this data. It's really similar to Z fighting. Don't know what that is? Have a look at this. Because these two planes are in the same location, we're getting that. This is a real issue to look out for, so just keep an eye out. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one, which is very similar as well. Nearest edge interpolated. Oh boy. Don't worry, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Now I have to explain how interpolation works, and the fact that the word being in the name is the only reason I know how this one functions. Thanks, documentation. You're so helpful. Very helpful. So helpful. Interpolation works by taking two points and estimating the values in between them, or interpolating between them, as it's called. Probably one of the most interpolation-heavy things you'll ever find are called keyframes, and these are perfect for me to explain how it works. You may not have noticed this, but you've been staring at interpolated objects this entire time. All the weird effects you've been seeing me use in my videos? They're all using interpolation. Except for that one. I actually simulated each piece with cloth physics. Uh, we're getting off topic. Enough about that stuff. I need to explain what keyframes are. See this? You might recognize this. Maybe you've seen it before. And maybe you already know what it means. This is the universal symbol for a little thing called the keyframe. All keyframes use interpolation. And, uh, oh, what's this? Okay, I'll admit that was kind of cheesy. But anyway, I put some keyframes down here already. Let me just delete those to show you what I did. So my cube is here in this spot, at 0, 0, 0 on the X, Y, and Z values. If I hit I on my keyboard, I can insert a keyframe for any one of these options. I'm going to choose Location. And as you can see, one of the keyframes I deleted just came back. Okay, so if I choose another frame, then move this cube and hit I again, I can then key another frame. Get it? Keyframe? Actually, I don't know why it's called that. Anyway, I can insert another keyframe of my choosing. So this time again, I'm going to choose location. Now what happens if I hit the play button on the timeline here? It moves, and it moves smoothly. But I never moved it frame by frame, and I never placed extra keyframes in between those points. That's just the two keyframes. So how is it so smooth? It works like that because between the two locations my cube here's moving is da 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 interpolated. But wait a minute, you haven't even seen the half of it. This is the free version of DaVinci Resolve. You can go get it right now if you want. Just like Blender, the keyframes in here are also symbolized as a square rotated by 45 degrees. I don't know if you noticed this, but over here in the inspector, there are keyframe buttons everywhere. This is how everything in my videos move around. From my animated arrows to my zoom-ins, things flying on and off the screen and spinning. It's all keyframed. 
and it's all interpolated. And now that I explained all that, I can easily explain the interpolation part in the interpolated edge option. See, the nearest edge interpolated option ignores vertices and instead transfers from edges to edges. Interpolated means that instead of grabbing the value from each end of the edge, like the last option did, it takes the value from in between them and from wherever your edge happens to be. The reason I explained keyframes is because in a sense, you can think of the vertices at the end here as though they are keyframes, because in between these two points, the values are being interpolated. Okay, enough storytelling here, you slacker. <clears throat> Having explained all of that, I can move on to the next option. Okay, so you remember nearest edge vertex? Yeah, that one. This option does almost exactly what that one does, but instead of tracing along the nearest edge to find a vertice, this one traces along the face of, well, a face. Taking a vertice, it looks and finds the nearest face. Then traveling along the face, it looks for the nearest vertice. After that, it transfers from the closest one it finds. There's also some positional fighting that can go on here, similar to Z fighting, like what we saw in the nearest edge vertex option. If the vertice is in the exact center of the face, it'll have that same issue, and it'll try and choose between the four vertices on that face. So there either needs to be a vertice in the center of the face that they can take data from, or the vertice needs to be offset to be closer to the one you want them to take the data from. So just keep that in mind. Okay, on to the next one then. Nearest face interpolated. You know what? This one sounds really familiar. If you don't see it yet, that's okay. I'm just going to point my finger at it and blurt out what it is. Nearest face interpolated is nearest edge interpolated, but with face as. Yeah, I'm getting bored. That means that the values you get are using interpolation, and you'll be transferring values from wherever your mesh faces just so happen to be. This is, of course, done over each and every face. I kind of downplayed this one, but really, it's one of the best options. Interpolation from a face can be used for a lot of things. And I mean a lot of cool things. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, let's just move on. Next, we have my favorite, projected face interpolated. You don't understand that? That's okay. You're about to learn after I get back to it, because I'm skipping it. Don't worry, I'll come back to it. I just need to explain something else. That would be this, and this, and this, and the fact that they're all copies. Thanks, Blender. Thanks. That's a pathetic crowd of me clapping. Moving on to the next set of options, you might notice some familiar sounding names. We already know what topology does, so I don't need to explain that one. The one after that is the nearest vertices option, and a lot like topology here, it's a copy of one of the older options up there. Just to clear things up, this is the nearest vertex option up here in the vertex data stuff. The only reason they have different names is because they're referring to edges, and like I said before, edges are the lines in between two vertices. A single vertice, or how it's supposed to be pronounced, I've been butchering it this entire time, a single vertex doesn't have an edge. So if anyone was wondering, that's the only difference here. The, uh, the name. Stop. Just stop. The next option, nearest edge, is yet another copy. It's a copy of nearest edge vertex, except it skips the part where it searches for the vertex, instead just finding the nearest edge. Also, the description kind of explains everything. Copy from nearest edge using midpoints. Midpoints being the very center of an edge, or a face. So it basically compares the center of two or more edges. Anyway, the next option is nearest face edge. The description says copy from closest edge of closest face using midpoints. So I guess it's just mapping with a little bit of a different algorithm. Nearest face, closest edge. Using midpoints from the faces, or edges, I can't tell which. The description kind of leads you towards uh, believing you're using face midpoints. And yeah, it might be. There isn't really any way to test for that, so I assume it's using the midpoints for the faces to map the data. And then I think it traces along the face to find the nearest edge. Or it could be using the midpoints from the edges and not the faces. 
not that it really matters. This is edge data we're talking about. The, uh, this whole section is useless. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on to the next option, I guess. Projected edge interpolated. I honestly don't even know how you can use this one with edges. I don't think you can. Or rather, I don't think you would benefit. Once you understand how the projected options work, you'll understand what I mean. I'll be back to this one in a little bit. So, moving on to the mapping options under face corner data. The first option is uh, topology. Again, do I have to say I'm skipping it at this point? So the next one is nearest corner and best matching normal. Here we finally have an option that's not just a copy of a previous one. Or is it? Actually, it is a copy. It's a copy of one of the ones that are coming up, which is also a copy of one of the previous ones. Let's take a better look at this little atrocity. Wait, atrocity? An extremely wicked or cruel act, typically one involving physical violence or injury. Huh. Close enough. It was actually really hard for me to figure this one out. It took me a few months, in fact. The description says it copies from the nearest corner, which has the best matching normal. Not much to go by, huh? But if you look really closely, you'll see a slim similarity between these. Do you see it? I bet not. <sighs> I'll point it out. Corner. 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 Did you catch on? Because I don't expect you to. Don't even. Don't even try. Do not go down that rabbit hole. You see those? Yeah. Those. Just those three words. That's the only thing. The only clue that this is a copy of this. Whoever wrote this documentation, I hate you. I hate you so much. What, nothing this time? No? <sighs> Where's that pathetic crowd of me when you need them? So this option is just a copy of that option, which is also a copy. It's a copy of nearest face vertex under the vertex data properties. And it does exactly the same thing. All it does is look for the nearest corner of a face, which is also a vertice. The difference this time is that it also calculates normal angles and then transfers based on that. Luckily, the documentation does specify that it's using split normals, also known as face corner normals, to match the vertices. This means that it gets rid of that whole issue with positional fighting. Since it's also matching the normals on top of matching the faces, it can tell which vertices are the correct ones to transfer from and to. There's just one problem. We don't have this option for any of the other data types. Just normals and whatever the heck is, oh yeah, that. The option that doesn't work. Well, let's move on to the next one. This one's description says, copy from nearest corner, which has the face with the best matching normal to destination corners face one. <clears throat> wow. Clearly, I understand that. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, come on. Come on. What the... But, uh, uh, Uses sources corner having the most similar face normal with destin Blech. Blech. uses sources corner having the most similar face normal with destination one from those sharing the nearest sources vertex. I can barely even read this. So if it wasn't obvious enough, this is uh, just a copy of the last one, but this time it's using the faces normal. The last option used the ones on the corners, the ones that are magenta colored. Aside from the, uh, difference in description, uh -huh, that, there's not really much of a difference as far as function goes. It uses the same algorithm as the last one, and the next one. Speaking of the next one, let's go ahead and talk about it, because this one is just a copy. Anyway, this one finds the nearest face, and then it finds the nearest corner, which is also just a vertice. And it's also just a copy of nearest face vertex in the vertex data properties. But I already said that, and uh, there's really no point in sticking around. Moving on to the next option, we have nearest face interpolated. <laughs> oh, no, no. Yes, again, it's a copy. Well, we already know what interpolation is, so I don't have to explain that part. And we know that it's using faces because of the name. 
Well, it's using interpolated face values. If you remember correctly, that means that it's grabbing whatever it's closest to, even if it's not grabbing from the corners. Just like nearest face interpolated up there in the vertex data, it takes whatever value it happens to be closest to, and it can take that value from literally any spot on the face. Anyway, that's that. Now let's move on to the next option. Oh, yeah, I still have another set of options to go over, don't I? I'm, uh, gonna skip this one for now. Anyway, that makes these the next set of options. And as you can see, there's not much left. Of course, the first option is topology. Needless to say, I would be explaining this thing four times if I did uh, explain it every time. Boop, get out of here. After that one, we have nearest face. This one is self-explanatory, at least I hope. The description says that it copies from the nearest polygon, also known as a face, and it does so using center points. That means it's just mapping these faces as if they were vertices, one to another based on their distance, really, really simple. The next one is best normal matching. This is the only option I've seen that only uses normals for mapping. The goal of this is basically just to transfer the ones that look the most alike which is of course based on the normals and not based on the distance from each face. And the normals it uses are the face normals. Since it's the ones you can't edit, it makes it kinda hard to slip up. Very simple, very straightforward, very nice. Ah, we're finally here. Projected face interpolated. Da, da, da. I, I don't have any sound effects. Sorry for your ears. Now, if you remember, I said that I was going to get back to all four of these. Well, the first three. So, as you may recall, I said that this one was my favorite. Well, you're about to find out why. You might remember that we have the exact same option up here in the vertex data section. Remember, I skipped over it? Well, now I'm here with nothing left but this one to explain. But this time it's a little bit different. Because they're all copies of each other, all I have to do is explain one of them. I mean, there are small differences that of course I'm gonna be going over. I just don't want to explain this thing four times in a row. So don't worry, I'm not leaving anything out. Anyway, as we already know, these are all copies of each other. Well, excluding this one. I mean, technically, yeah, it is a copy of all the others, but it doesn't make any sense as to why it's here. And I'm sure you'll understand why as soon as I explain it. So I'll start by explaining this one, which explains the other two. But the one under the edge data, eh, I'll have to explain it by itself. Okay, so the one under the face corner options. How does it work? First of all, we know it's using interpolation because it says it right here in the name. We can also assume that it has something to do with faces because it says it there too. But aside from the two things we know it does just based off of the name, there's something else here. It says projected. Okay, what's that? It's uh, a thing that, uh, that does something. And in order to explain it, I'm gonna have to go out of the way and explain something else. Something that might at first seem completely unrelated. But once you understand how that works, you'll see the connection. What am I talking about? Ray tracing. That's right, ray tracing. The thing my graphics card can't do because I haven't upgraded yet. <clears throat> Now, if you already know what ray tracing is, good for you. But a lot of people don't know what it does. And even the people who do know what it does don't know how it works with this modifier, since Blender's documentation is so well put together, if you know what I mean. So first, I need to explain what ray tracing is, and then I can explain how it's connected to this option. So, ray tracing. You've heard about it in video games. Maybe. It's been around since before the dinosaurs. <laughs> oh no. Seriously, where are those clappers at? I guess they, uh, I guess they moved on. <clears throat> guess I should get back to the script. It's been around since before it's been around in video games. In fact, video games have used it since before NVIDIA made such a big fuss about it. But I'm not talking about NVIDIA's ray tracing. I'm talking about the ray tracing invented in order to view 3D models on a 2D screen, which was invented way back in 1979. If you want some more backstory, you can read the Wikipedia page, which tells you basically anything you'd ever want to know. But they kind of want money for coffee or something. Get out of here. Get, 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 die. 
This article is the only useful thing I ever found in the documentation. It's at the bottom and out of sight. Thanks again, Blender. Thanks again. It's an extremely interesting read if you want to go check that out. Of course, I'm going to put it in the description or the comments, but that reveals a whole heck of a lot of stuff. Things you definitely don't want to be brushing over if you want to learn about this modifier, or rendering in general. So, how do rays work? Honestly, I don't fully understand it myself, like how it's able to figure out what angle a face is at, or even just the color of the surface it lands on. I don't actually know how it grabs that data, but somehow it does, and I guess it's not really that important to think about because it does exactly what you would expect and you don't have to know exactly what it's doing in order to use it. So I'm going to disregard the magic behind it and just go over what it does. Ray tracing or ray casting works by casting a virtual ray of light, which is basically just a made up line, a line that acts as a probe to go get data. How do I know that? I summarized it from another Wikipedia page on ray tracing for graphics, which was linked at the top of the article for ray casting. Anyway, there's a spot in this article about ray tracing that helps us understand how rays work a lot better. I'm kind of picking and choosing what I want to read, so if you want to read the rest of it for more information, go right ahead. But anyway, there's a line here that says that typically each ray must be tested for intersection with some subset of all the objects in the scene. Once the nearest object is identified, the algorithm will estimate the incoming light at the point of intersection, examine the material properties of the object, and combine this information to calculate the final color of the pixel. From the way that sounds, it's able to attach to an object and then read its properties. But I can't find any way to confirm it for sure, so take what I've just said with a grain of salt although it does look as if that's how it works. And if so, that would explain how it gets the color of a surface, and how it's able to pull the angle of a normal, which is exactly what we're doing with the data transfer modifier. I said that I don't really know how it works, but that's just because I didn't know a couple months ago when I recorded that. Well, me from a couple months ago, that's how it works. And that's the progress I've made on this video. Speaking of the progress I made, I actually ended up rendering a visual over a year ago. It was supposed to be used in this video, but I only made it to explain how ray tracing works, and that was the me from a year ago, although it was accurate. This visual is just showing us how it works with cameras, because for every single pixel that you specify in the rendering settings, it has to cast a ray for, and then the sample count is how many times it recasts rays to collect more data. But that's going way off topic, and I really only wanted to explain what was up with this render. So just forget about that, I guess. Way too much information. Now it doesn't exist. Yay! So how does all of that tie into this option in the modifier? Well, we know it's transferring normals, and we know the values it's grabbing are interpolated. But on top of that, it's also using ray tracing. And to use ray tracing, it has to somehow know which way to send the rays out. So how does it know which way to cast those rays? Well, of course, I was able to figure that out too. And what I found was that it does this using its own normals. So for each and every face corner normal, it casts a ray. Nice. Earlier in this video, I explained that interpolation is already turned on on the normals, without even having to set it to be shaded smooth. And that is where the interpolated part comes in. Because wherever the ray happens to land, that's the value it's going to take. And you can, of course, do what I'm doing here and just mess around with the... Uh, the stuff here. I mean that you can fiddle around with this to know where your rays are going. That's what I meant to say before my brain went dead. So not only is it ray traced, it's also interpolated. Ray trace plus interpolation equals my favorite option. And I'll show you what I mean right now. Let's go back to that plane I subdivided a bunch of times. You forgot about that, didn't you? Well, I didn't. And now that we know what these options do, we should have a better understanding of what the outcome will be. So again, this plane has been subdivided a lot, so it has a bunch of faces. Having a bunch of faces means I also have a bunch of normals. And for each one of these normals, projected face interpolated is going to cast a virtual ray. Meaning with enough subdivisions, I should be able to project a picture onto this plane. What kind of picture, you might ask? The monkey. <laughs> forget that. Just uh, d delete. So I've got a bunch of vertices on my plane. I have a monkey head. I don't even know why they named it Suzanne, but it was probably <clears> the guy. Who just fast this forward that a little bit. And the so smart. Yeah, okay, okay, we're good. So I rotated the monkey inside of edit mode so that it will be facing straight down at my plane. Now I'm going to go out of edit mode, select my plane, and add a data transfer modifier. Then select my source mesh. 
Now I don't have to uncheck this because the origin of my model is still down there. Since I went into edit mode to move it, it's going to transfer the same data whether this button's on or off, unless I decide to move it around in object mode. So I'm going to tell the modifier to transfer normals. It's going to say, oh, you need to go turn on uh, that setting. So I'm going to turn it on. Then I'm going to set it to 180 because I don't want it to be messing around with any of my normals. Now back in the modifier, we need to set this to be using projected face interpolated so that it's actually using the one I'm talking about. So I don't forget. Okay, so I actually transferred the normals from a monkey over to a plane. But we're not done. There's something else going on. While it might look perfectly fine to the untrained eye, I can see that this is actually inverted. The normals are backwards. Instead of having a convex shape like it should, it has a concave shape. So instead of bumping out, it's bumping in. Again, very hard to see. I would explain what the heck's going on here, but this is actually caused by something I already went over. Whenever we add a plane to our scene, its face normal is facing up, and the monkey that I transferred the normals from is facing down, and the normals are facing out. Now if you recall, the data transfer modifier won't transfer face corner angles. That means that I have to manually invert the face normal on the plane. And after I do, well, there we go. Oh, yeah, and I might as well show you something while I'm in here anyway. You remember I said that the rays are cast from the face corner normals? Well, what happens when we rotate them? Oh, god, lag. <clears throat> As you can see, the normals are directly connected to the angle at which the rays are cast out. At least it is for this type of data. See, here's the thing. When using projected face interpolated, this group of options under the face corner data use the angle the face corner normals are holding in order to cast a ray. But that's not the case when transferring other types of data like vertex groups. Everything under the vertex data dropdown uses not the corner normals, but the vertex normals. Like face normals, they're the kind you can't edit the angle of without actually rotating the faces they're on. You can assume that if these options use vertex normals, and the ones under the face corner data use face corner normals, then the ones in face data probably use face normals normals. And sure enough, with a little bit of testing, it's easy to confirm this. But that leaves one question. What exactly kind of normals are the edge data options using? Because there's no such thing as an edge normal. So what's really going on here? Well, it doesn't really matter, because this option is essentially useless. But if you really want to know, I did do some digging. It's using vertex normals. Again, not that it really matters. It still transfers the data, but I mean, since it's just on-off values, how does interpolated ray tracing kind of fit in there? I really doubt Blender could explain this. They'll probably remove it if they see my video. So let's point at it and laugh while we still can. Nah, too boring. Anyway, that's how the projected face interpolated option works in the data transfer modifier. But you might think, yeah, come on, how do you know this is ray tracing? I mean, yeah, it projects and then it pulls that data back, but it doesn't specifically say that it does so using rays. Or does it? Yeah, um, I may have been keeping something a secret. You may have noticed I never went over these options down here, and there's a reason. Again, I have no sound effects. Sorry for your ears. We have the option to change the ray distance and the ray radius. Why, whatever could that mean? Well, there you have it. Proof that this modifier is using ray tracing for the projected face interpolated option. I just haven't gone over these yet because they're used with that option and that option alone. So of course I'm going to explain that one first. I mean, all four of those options alone. It works with all four of them. Anyway, like the names suggest, this one controls the ray radius and this one controls the ray distance. Ray radius is kind of finicky. I wouldn't touch it. And ray distance just works the way you would expect. It basically just limits how far the rays are cast. Anyway, those options are really simple. So that brings us to the last thing I haven't talked about. And forgive me because I'm gonna be a little lazy. I said I would be going over these blending modes, but this video is almost an hour long. And Photoshop kind of has an official page that tells you everything you'd ever want to know. At least if you can understand it. I'll be going over these in a future video. Well, what do I have next? Uh, oh, I think that's all. I guess uh, that's the end of this video. Took a long time. More than a year. Hmm. 
Well, I guess roll the outro that I made before I even made the video. If you like what I'm doing, don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button. It's the best way to see more of my videos whenever I finally upload them. And don't forget to hit the like button as well. The like button helps me out a lot because it lets YouTube know that what I'm making might be worth watching. I should probably get out of here before I start rambling. I know people love it when I do. Hmm. I should probably leave. You know what, now that I think about it, why can't we transfer shape keys? Shape keys are a type of data after all. Not only that, but the way that you transfer them right now has a lot of limitations. Last I checked, you couldn't transfer shape keys to a model that doesn't match. I mean, I guess we could just use a shrink wrap modifier or some other crap like that, but come on. I want more complicated stuff to play around with and make videos about. Also, the ability to transfer shape keys and then use projected face interpolated would be awesome. It would change so many Oh, so now you come back? Don't look at me that way. I see how it is. Where are you going? Where? Come back here. Hey. Hello. <clears throat> like and subscribe, guys. Shut up.